Father, I thank you. Thank you for being that good, good God. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for the privilege that we have, we that are sitting in this sanctuary. Thank you for the privilege that we have of being your witnesses, being your mouthpiece, being your eyes, being your feet, being your hands in this 21st century world in which we live in. God, your will be done. Your will be done in our lives, in the life of this church. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you, praise team. Thank you, Sheila. And this is a compliment, uh, uh, not that you, uh, that meaning anything else by this, but you said that wasn't a worship song. So my ears began to open. Now, what's she going to do? But that indeed was a worship song. And it sounded a bit like I feel sometimes when God doesn't react to my desires, to my commands, like I want Him to, and God's timing is not my timing. And sometimes we just get all confused and we wonder, you know, God, where are you? Where are you? Don't you know that I'm talking to you? Don't you know that I'm your child? So where are you? That is what I picked up uh, early in that song, truly it is uh, a worship song. Turn in your Bibles today, if you will, to, to uh, uh, Psalms, the chapter. And we aren't going to be reading all of that. We're just going to be picking verses uh, as, we, as we move through that. And our title, of course, today uh, on our slide is Sanctity of life. But I'm expanding that a little further in my message, sanctity of all life. And you're going to hear my, my take on that as we move further through the message. I would remind you that there are a couple of things. I, I'm, I'm very proud to be an American. I, I am. I remember that uh, song that I know maybe Merle Haggard used to sing, proud to be an American, and I am. But I'm ashamed of America for a couple of reasons. I'm very ashamed of her. And number one of those reasons is June 26, 2015. The Supreme Court declared same-sex marriages legal in all states. And then the second thing that I'm ashamed of America about is January 22, 1973, the Supreme Court legalized abortion on demand in all 50 states. So I, I love America. I do. And some of you sitting in the house today has even gone to battle for America. But those are, those are the two things. I know that we aren't a perfect people. That's evident as we read the newspapers and watch the news. And I know that. But let me remind you of something else. God knows that too. But he still loves us. And he's still counting on us to be his witness in the world in which we live. Now I have to do another thing before we get involved in this message today. And number one, I don't know whether you call this a disclaimer or not, but this is a tough message for me to do. Not because I believe in abortion, not at all. I, I believe that it is wrong, and I know that it's wrong. But in a church our size, we're counting this group and, and the 11 o'clock group as well. In a church our size, no doubt there are people sitting in the congregation that has experienced or had an abortion. And you're here not to be beat up on. You're here to be reminded of God's love for you. You're here to be reminded that God's forgiveness, 
when we pray and when we ask Him. So that is why that I, one of the reasons that I've changed my message from sanctity of life, and we normally think of the life that is in the womb, and I believe that as soon as it is conceived that it is a life, I, I believe that without a doubt. And I think that it's wrong to take that life. But at the same time, I think sanctity of all life is important to God as well. What I mean by that is the people that you and I just don't like. It's the people that sometimes we fight with. It's the people that sometimes we squabble with and we've already marked them off of our welcome home list. Life is, sanct is, is special, it's, it's valuable because God created us in His image. And if God hadn't cared who we was, he would have made us like the animals. He could have done that. He did not. People are special to God. You are special to God. I am special to God. Don't ever forget that. And if you say, well, I don't understand. I have trouble understanding why I'm so special to God when things happen in my life like they do. Well, let me just remind you. You are special to God that he sent his son, Jesus Christ down from heaven where he was in the same heaven that many of our friends are already there that according to the scripture is a very beautiful place, is a very serene place, is a very calm place, it's a very peaceful place. But yet, God sent him down to die for our sins. Why would he do that? Because you and I are valuable to God. Doesn't matter where you've been. Doesn't matter where you are. Doesn't matter what you're planning. You're still valuable to God. Now, I said all of that to say this. Years ago, and we was in this sanctuary at that time. Years ago, I did a message on sanctity of life. And I came down pretty hard. I came down pretty hard, and there was a lady here, and I didn't hear it from her, but someone told me later that she was here that day, and she had had an abortion. And, and, and I heard her from the pulpit, and that's not my job to hurt you. My job is to love you, and my job is to tell you the truth based upon God's Word. That is my job. If I'm not doing my job, you need to get rid of me. You need to do that, folks. But that lady told somebody as she left, she said, I'll never be back in that church again. And I'm here to remind you that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. What is falling short of the glory of God? Falling short of His expectations for us. That's not just sinning. That is not obeying as well. He said that. Our title is Sanctity of All Life and certainly the beginning of life at, concep at conception. Life begins. And I know I'm preaching to the choir. I think all of us sitting in here probably uh, believe that too. But the reason I ha I've got to visit this again today is because of the young people that are here. The children that are here. That you don't have to mess up your life you don't have to mess up your life. Wait until you're married. To have sex. That's a biblical way. It is a gift from God. He gave us that gift. 
and he expects us to handle it correctly. Let me read the scripture, or at least portions of it. I'm going to start at the very last two verses. A bit unusual, but the music kind of had have led us to this point. This is one of King David's writings. Whether you know it or not, King David was not a perfect man. Probably not too many sins that he did not commit. But he loved God. God loved him. If we want to know more about David and, and, and the hurt of what he went through, then we can read Psalms 51. Don't read it today while I'm preaching, but read it later on. Psalms 51, you'll find out that David probably was one of the most hurtful men ever to live on the face of the earth. Find him pouring out his heart to God in Psalms 51. And this is after that God had forgiven him. God had cleansed them. And in 139, the last two verses, 23 and 24, David was pouring out his heart to God throughout this passage. But here he cried out, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Let me ask you, when was the last time that you prayed that open with God? God knows us. He knows our sins. He knows our thoughts. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our strength. But here we find David after in the Old Testament, the New Testament grace and forgiveness. David fell on his face somewhere. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. How transparent can one become before God? How transparent have I become before God? How transparent have you become before God? Here's a man that committed even murder. And he had his time. You know, I think God forgives us as soon as we pray. I don't have a doubt about that. I, I think that's scriptural. But sometimes I think he lets us stay in our hurt long enough to realize that it's not only comfortable to hurt. And we know that we have forgiveness. But we need to understand that a hurt many times is because of our sins, unfaithfulness, whatever. So then, after the two that I've mentioned, Ronald Reagan, the late Ronald Reagan president, Ronald Reagan on January the 13th, 1984, he issued a proclamation designating January the 22nd, which was the third Sunday of that year when he made that proclamation, January the 22nd as the first national sanctity of Human Life Day. The churches, your church as well, has been honoring that through either a, a, a message from the pulpit or certainly prayer and a reminder from the pulpit. We have done that every Sunday. And I trust those folks in the little white church that they did that too. We're remembering that. And that's what we're doing today. Let me read a couple of additional verses here, and then we'll get into the body of our outline. 
Very, the very first verse, O Lord, thou hast searched me and know me. Thou hast searched my past. I'm transparent in your eyes, whether I want to be or not. You have searched me, and now you know me. You know my downsetting. You know my uprising. You compassed me about uh, for the word. You know every word of my tongue, O Lord. Thou knowest altogether. Thou hast been behind me, in front of me, before me, uh, above me, beneath me. Such knowledge too wonderful for me, I cannot attain it, David said. Wherever we are, how secret we might be doing it, that God knows that, God sees that, and God understands that, and He's ready to forgive us. In dealing with people down through the years, I have found out that some of our biggest self-imposed problems, some of our largest self-imposed problems is not accepting God's forgiveness when we ask Him. And I can find nowhere in my Bible that God delays His forgiveness. And I know I'm speaking to Bible scholars, and if you find somewhere, I would want to know that. But yet we hold on to those. They hinder our joy, which I think is a sin. John 10, 10, Jesus said, the thief who is Satan cometh only to kill and to steal. Steal what? Steal your joy. Steal your faith. Steal your trust. Steal your witness. But Jesus said, I'm come. That you might have life and have it more abundantly. When I think of abundant life, I think of all that I need to survive, to enjoy. So that's why. I think it's a sin to have joy in our salvation. Let me get, let's, let's get back. Well, let me read a couple of other scriptures, and I'll pick up uh, down at the uh, 13th verse. For thou hast possessed my reins. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from you. When I was made in secret, when I was conceived, it wasn't hid from you. Thine eyes did see my substance. Yet being unperfect, listen to this, yet being unperfect, and in your book all my members were written. And then David kind of closes out. All right, God, now I'm transparent before you. Search me and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wickedness in my ways. Wow, what a prayer. What a prayer that would be. So why is life sacred at conception in the womb, in the mother's belly, as the belly begins to poke out, make room for the child? Why is it so sacred? I think this verse pretty much reminds us of that. God created man, humans, in his own image. In the image of God created he them. Male and female created he them. We were created in the image of God. And, and the Bible tells us that God is a spirit. We must worship him in spirit and in truth. 
But here he says that we are created in the image of God. So God looks something like we look. Why would he do that? Because he wanted to have a relationship with us. So whenever abortion takes place, then that person is taking a life. One of the commandments, thou shalt not kill. So that's why sanctity of life means something to us. And not only just in the womb, it means something to us when that develops and it is out visible. I don't know if you have followed the news or not, but I think it's in Roanoke. You can help me. This little two-year-old boy. They showed his picture, beautiful little boy. But life is beautiful. Always. But his mother and her boyfriend was using him. Was abusing him, not slapping a beating, and I'm sure that was it because they eventually killed him. But they was using him sexually. That's why life is precious in the womb. Life is precious when it's born. Life is precious at any age. And these little guys, including those in the womb, they don't have a voice. That's why you and I must speak for them. You and I must stand up for them. You and I must love them. So God created in His own image, and in, in the image of God created He, male and female. So whenever you and I dislike somebody, we are disliking what God created. So we probably should get our dislike list. Oh, we've got them up here. You say, I don't have one. I don't either. But we've got them up here. We probably should get our dislike list. And I would suggest that we write them out. Pastor Melvin. Pastor Key. Pastor Taylor. I'm just being facetious at that. I hope they aren't on your list. I think we should write that list out and then we could get this 23rd scripture and get down on our knees somewhere on our face or just sit on our butts or whatever we need to do and say, search me, O God, and know my thoughts, know my heart. And get the things out of the way that hinders me from being who you created me to be. No matter what the past is. Abortion. Whatever. No matter what the past is, God, get it out of my way. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I want you to, uh, I know that you see me transparent. I want to stand before you. Trans I think that's what David was doing here. He, he was just standing transparent before God. I know you know. I know too. But I'd love you to get it out of my way. Some of these I was just focusing on words, but we're going to run out of time and I want to move very quickly on through the remainder of the message. So God created us in His image. And then Psalms 139, 14. I will praise Thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Let me ask you this. When was the last time you praised God? You say today, I, I, I hope that's right. Sometimes we think this is praising God. Sometimes we think this is praising God. 
Praising God is getting everything out of our minds and worshiping an awesome God. When we sing, when we give of our tithes and our offerings, when we read from the Holy Scriptures, when we listen to the message, when we respond to the message, that is worshiping God. But worshiping God does not quit. When we have our benediction, we do our greetings, we walk out the door. Worshiping God really begins. See, this is like a gas station. We fuel up and we're ready to go. We fuel up and we're ready to go. So who decides who is to live and who is to die? I know we pro-choice and, well, we aren't pro-life. But once that baby is conceived, it's a life and it's a responsibility of the mother and of the dad. Dad, you're involved in this too. The woman has to go through all of these problems of embarrassment and all of that, particularly if it's out of wedlock. But you're just as responsible as she is for what is taking place. So that's why, that's why I urge the young people to wait. Wait until... You find someone that you love and then you marry them and then you... And this is just kind of answering the question uh, that we just asked. In Ephesians 2.10, I think here is our answer. For we are His, Him being God, we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So you wouldn't tear down something that somebody, someone else was building would you? No, you wouldn't. I wouldn't either. But that's what we do when we mess into God's plan. When we mess into God's plan, we tear down what God is building. The workmanship can be translated as a, as a, as a, as a project. It can be translated... As, as something very special. God is still working on us even at age 89. God's still working on us, folks, regardless of how young you are, how middle-aged you might be, how old you might be. God never gives up on working on us and making us a better person from day to day when we allow Him to make us a better person. Sanctity of human life. Number one, God created us in His image, giving life sacred value. So when you talk about, when we talk about somebody, we're talking about somebody that God values. Secondly, life is valuable to God, even before birth. And we, we understand that. I, I don't think I need to really do a lot of beating up on that. And certainly if you, you are here and you've had an abortion, you're here because God loves you and because you love God, you've already confessed that. That doesn't mean, young people, that you can do it and confess it, although you can. That means that there's a lot of hurt goes into it along the way. Life is valuable to God even before birth. Jeremiah said this word in verse uh, in chapter 1, 4 and 5. The word of the Lord uh, came upon me saying, Before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. Folks, God knew you and I. He knew what we was going to do. And yet he still allowed us to be born. He still loves us. He sent his son Jesus Christ down from heaven to die for us. Whether your sin, whatever your sins might be to die in your place. 
So before I was formed, uh, thee in the belly, I knew you, God said. Before thou comest forth out of the womb, I sanctified you. And I ordained you a prophet. You know what? I wondered. I wondered if that was true. What? That's biblical. That's biblical. So how many, and I think it, abortion is over 60 million now, and the thing that's in your bulletin says 3,300 babies a day are aborted. I wonder if there were some Jeremiah's in that. I wonder if there were some great scientists in that. I wonder if there were some great preachers in that. Maybe a Billy Graham or a Billy Sunday. Or maybe a great president that would have brought our nation together. Well, before you came forth out of your mother's womb, I ordained thee a prophet. So I just want to remind you that God knew who we were, knew what we were going to do, but He still loves us very much. Now, we're going to have to move here pretty quickly. I've got something right at last that I really want us to do. And then the third point is being created in God's image is more than a privilege. It's a responsibility. That's why you're involved in this sanctity uh, for all life. Because it's a privilege to have been created in the image of God. And along with that image goes responsibility of living for God. Now, I'm, I'm, I didn't put this up there, and uh, I, I want you to turn in your Bibles, Matthew 5, uh, 21 and 22. I, I'm going to make a final comment here, and then uh, we're going to let you go down to the cafe and get coffee, okay? Matthew 5, 21, 22. And I don't know if you write in your Bibles or not. I know at one time I did, and I thought it was such a holy book that In your book, marked in your book, but I saw other people were doing it, and, and I, I, I guess I'll have to say they influenced me. So I began to doing it a little bit myself, and now I've got marks all over my scriptures. But Matthew 5, and I hope you're there, uh, and, and I, I would like for you to circle it or mark it. If, if you're marking your Bibles, you don't have to. Uh, it's your Bible. You can do what you want to. But Matthew, Mark, Ma Matthew uh, 5, uh, 21. But before I read those verses, I've got you there now. You know, in my typing, in my making my PowerPoints, in my writing letters, something that I really want to get across, I bold it. So I do a lot of writing in bold to remind me that, hey, don't forget this. But then I got to thinking that we kind of do that about sin. So abortion would be very bold. Murder would be very bold. Stealing would be very bold. Abusiveness is within, the, within, a, within a home, very bold. See, I've got those marked bold. They are, they are bad sins. Let's read the Scriptures, 21, 22. You have heard that it was said by them of old times, that means in the Old Testament, that means other generations. These are what we call old folks. Mom and I talk about old folks a whole lot, but they are ones that already passed away. We don't really talk about much us being old folks anymore, but we are. 
But anyway, you've heard it was said by them of old times, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. Now, this is Jesus talking. It's read in, in the Bibles that are printed that way. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. No, that's not bold. Anger, anger is not bold in my writings. Well, it's bold in Jesus' writings. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Rekha, which simply means that he's kind of empty-headed. He don't know much. He's kind of dumb. Whosoever shall say to his brother, Rekha, shall be in danger of the council. But... Whosoever shall say, thy fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Now, we find anger. We find putting someone down, and we put them down when we say we don't like them. And let me just remind you while we're here, when you don't like somebody, don't share that with other people. Try to get other people to not like the same people that you don't like. Anger. Not bold on my list. And I know there are good anger and there are bad anger. The Scripture says that. And then we find putting somebody down. And then thirdly, we find cursing someone. I didn't say that. Jesus said it. So maybe I need to go back over my list and put some bold things in there that I'm, I, I'm sure abortion and those kind of things, they are really bad. And, and I agree with that, folks. But the Bible is saying to us that when we are angry with someone, when we talk about someone, when we gossip, when we try to invite someone else to dislike our enemies just like we dislike them, the Bible is saying that should be in bold on our list too. I need to get my last point up real quickly. And then we're going to the cafe. All right, let me got there a little too quick. As we go through this week, I'm challenging you. As we move through this week, mentally place the name of each person that you encounter. Doesn't mean that you fight with or anything of that nature. Maybe your wife, maybe your husband, maybe your boss. But try using this just this week. Maybe not everybody. God made Keith in his image. Would that change the way that you like or dislike that individual? God made you write that. You fill that in, in His image. Father, thank you again for our time together. I know that I've chased a lot of rabbits, but Father, if there's someone in the house here that has had an abortion, they've asked forgiveness, then they have been forgiven. But Father, I just want to challenge those that sometimes that might become their way out. That it is wrong. It will cause them, even though Christ will forgive them, it will cause them a lot of pain and agony. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill, but I have come, Jesus said, that you might have life and have it more abundantly. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Our hymn of invitation.